We will resume. Um, Dr. Epen, I'll turn it to you for any closing remarks the UVM folks may have. I think we're gonna we're gonna go back to the hospital presidents and have them have the closing remarks. We're gonna start with Steve, I believe. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Chair Foster, Green Mountain Care Board, and all the public comments today. This is a critically important discussion for the state of Vermont, and I appreciate all the dialogue today. Everyone trying to do their best to get it right. As Vermont's level one trauma center, cancer center, children's hospital, and academic medical center, the medical center plays a crucial role in the health of our community, both locally and across the state of Vermont. We take that role seriously and we're very proud of it. In recent years, building a budget that allows us to deliver on that mission has become increasingly difficult. We've tried to navigate a very difficult economy and extremely tight labor market. Our 24 budget, our 24 budget would result in a margin of 3%, money that would be used to reinvest in our future, in our staff, equipment, and facilities, and most importantly, to better serve the patients who need us. Last year in 2022, we lost nearly $23 million. That is unsustainable. Through tremendous hard work by the 8,000 employees at the medical center in 23, we're gonna meet our margin target. That's a first step in regaining financial strength so we can be strong going forward to meet the needs of our patients. We're working very hard at the medical center to do our part in reducing labor expenses where possible, growing our own workforce, and making changes to improve patient access and revenue at the same time. Complicated, difficult, but important work. At the end of all this, our budget discussion for you come back to a simple reality. As a nonprofit hospital, we cannot be prepared for the next pandemic, support our aging population, and address challenges to access without budgets, budgets that allow us to cover the expenses of providing essential healthcare services to all Vermonters who need us. The budget we submitted reflects what we believe we need to care, to meet the care needs of the population that we serve. On behalf of the 8,000 employees of the UVM Medical Center, I look forward to continuing our conversation with you about how we can ensure, ensure a healthy future for all Vermonters. Thank you. And, and Owen, just, just to be clear, um, this was me, Chair Foster, I apologize, but I forgot this was only University of Vermont Medical Centers. And so each of the presidents from the other uh, partner organizations will have their closings after their um, sessions. So that's all we have for today for this until we go into executive session. Great. Um, our logistics will need to adjust a little. Um, uh, Director Lindbergh, are you here? It's a lot of I'm boxes. Here. Yeah, there yep. you are. Okay. Um, <laughs> do you want to go uh, straight to Porter now? Mm -hmm. or? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. All right. Let me just share. All right. So we'll have some themes. I think we've covered quite a bit of uh, some of the material um, in our conversations already, but there are a few things unique to Porter that I'd like to cover. Um, so one is, uh, you know, of all hospitals, uh, Porter showed, um, you know, the, the highest growth um, in NPR um, and uh, the highest growth in operating expenses. Um, it seems like the two things that are driving that are um, a favorable cost report and it looks like there's um, some significant increases in outpatient services at Porter. So um, do I have that right? That and there is a, a, a little bit of a unique piece to Porter, um, Sarah, in terms of the, when we broke down the, the increase in NPR for, those two, for that two year period, um, they did have, we had three different uh, buckets. We had the volume um, component, we had the rate increases from Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial, and then we had this other category that represented uh, payer mix, bad debt, and charity shifts from 22 to 24. Um, and for Porter, um, 
there was a significant amount of bad debt, meaning we wrote off a significant amount of claims for our EPIC transition. Um, so when you look at that bad debt level back in 2022 compared to the 2024, it actually looks like a revenue increase just because there's there's less um, less write off of revenue. Um, so I would just highlight that that one kind of uniqueness um, related to Porter. Okay, uh, that's helpful. Um, and we see Porter, uh, one of the very few hospitals where that NPR line is above the operating expense line. So I'm um, seeing uh, some, you know, pretty strong uh, financial recovery at Porter. Um, do you know why the the cost report was so so favorable for Porter uh, last year, or any guesses about that? So since they're a critical access hospital, um, they uh, Porter gets um, gets uh, rate inflation, if you will, on their Medicare patients. So um, when you think about the you know the 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 high use of contract labor and the salary adjustments that we've needed to make, um, that then worked into the the cost report settlement because that uh, that's how we get uh, the rates for the the critical access hospitals. So that's that's really what uh, what drove that increase there and in related to the to the cost report. Okay. Um, and would you highlight anything uh, unique about the um, employment cost per FTE at Porter versus uh, what we already have discussed? Okay. I don't think there's anything unique there, no. Okay. Um, and then this one, I think, um, I, uh, I'm sorry. I keep looking at the wrong screen when I'm trying to drive. Um, so we do see this, uh, you know, large increase in utilization. Again, that's just an adjusted discharge. And um, if I'm reading the numbers right, it seems like a lot of that is driven by uh, shifting uh, and seeing more outpatient care revenue. And so that adjusted discharge gets pulled way up. Um, and I did notice in one of your responses that um, I'm, I'm just curious if any of that um, change to revenue is being driven by the share um, sharing of orthopedic services uh, at Porter. Um, I'll let uh, Scott, I think Scott's back online. Scott Como, the CFO of uh, the Porter Medical Center, I think he can uh, validate that, but I do think that that's correct. I can Sarah. comment on it. I can comment on it, Rick, if Scott is not online. Okay. Go I'm here. And um, you're correct, Rick. There's orthopedic activity involved there. Part of the outpatient utilization drivers also are, are radiology and lab. Absolutely. But you've got it, Sarah. Okay. Um, all right. Um, and then uh, for migration, um, I, it was actually, I had never really looked at it this way. So I was surprised to see at how much care is being imported uh, or in migrating to the um, Porter service area. Um, and then the only thing that stood out here that I wanted to make sure I touched on was um, I was a little bit surprised to see such a substantial bump in the Medicare expenditures in calendar year 21 and didn't know if you had noticed that on your balance sheet or uh, you know if, if you could uh, have any insight about what was driving that kind of spike. Uh, I know you only saw half of those uh, funds in the HSA, not necessarily at Porter, um, but just curious if uh, you had a bump in Medicare utilization that was notable. Uh, nothing is coming to mind um, right now. Certainly on the revenue side, again, going to going back to the impact of the 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 contract labor that would show up. But in terms of utilization, I can't think of anything uh, specifically that um, that would have that would have drove up the a higher proportion of Medicare there. Unless Scott and Tom have have uh, any thoughts. I have noticed the trend as well. I can't put my finger on exactly the driver though. You know, if I had I, again, without uh, good, good, good afternoon, folks. This is Tom Thompson, the president, CEO of Porter. Appreciate your work. Uh, first time I get to chime in today. Um, if I had uh, surmised that this, I'd also say there might be a little shift uh, of commercial patients from our market. Um, so that might also contribute a little bit to that uh, data point. Okay. Yeah, and the only other thing that came to mind is um, I think that is when. 
the cyber attack might have affected um, some of the ability for services to be provided at the medical center. I just didn't know if that um, also might be contributing to that spike. That could have contributed for sure. We did a lot of diagnostics at that point from the medical center's uh, patients, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and then as far as the uh, cost report goes, uh, among the peer group, uh, Porter stands out as uh, you know quite large uh, for a critical access hospital in this peer group. Again, I think that's um, likely picking on some of that uh, shift to the outpatient revenue. Um, and then we see uh, quite a um, you know relatively low acuity of uh, 1.2 talked quite a bit about your initiatives related to CMI. Anything additional you want to highlight specific to Porter? No, nothing there. Okay. And it, do I have it right that um, increasing the CMI uh, for Medicare would not necessarily affect reimbursement there since it's uh, the cost report? Correct. Yeah, but CMI. It, but yeah, correct. CMI increases for critical access hospitals really don't uh, have a material impact. But if the severity is increasing, you know, other payers might, even if it's the same rate, they don't get a rate increase. If uh, the, the coding shows a higher severity, they still might, the, the reimbursement might go up commiserate with the uh, um, services that were provided. For other payers, there will be a small impact, but again, most of the CMI um, impacts are, are with Medicare patients. Yeah, okay. Um, and then we see, uh, as you were alluding to, that the uh, ratio of uh, admin to clinical salary is quite low here, um, probably due to the fact that a lot of those are flowing through UVMMC's uh, cost report. Uh, anything to, to flesh that out? You know, that's no, that's that's the connection that uh, uh, that can be made there um, in terms of the. The shared service FTEs and costs that that are brought um, to bear um, across the network are quite small um, at the at the Porter Medical Center. And uh, for uh, cash available for operations, we see you right at the median. Um, I was just curious. You know, you talked a lot about how you really consider yourself a network, and I just didn't know. Um, if you had um, specific benchmarks for the amount of cash on hand or margins uh, that is at each hospital level, or if you really monitor more that um, of that network wide. So the margins we do um, establish targets for all the the partners. Um, cash, uh, we, we we view that as a uh, we monitor that from a network perspective. Each partner still does have individual days cash on hand balances, as you, as you can see here in the in the data. Um, but that isn't. We don't have specific targets for days cash on hand for the individual partners. That uh, we target as a network in totality. Okay. And are you mostly looking at the um, EBITDA operating margin for those hospital level targets? Exactly. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, and then, uh, yeah, profitability, uh, I think, is another uh, place where um, you're very close to the median. That's right. You're actually exactly at the median, which is why I can't get you to pop up on there. Um, and then uh, we do see that the cost per ad adjusted discharge is just above the median um, at 12000 So um, despite a potentially uh, deflated CMI, uh, that that is uh, already within the range. Um, as far as cost coverage goes, uh, so very, I think, again, this might be some of that um, care pattern goofiness that uh, maybe led to different services. Uh, often see bigger dips when we have smaller numbers. So um, I don't think, you know, I think that's why that looks as dramatic as it does. Um, and I know that, you know, among critical access hospitals uh, for uh, commercial, um, that that Porter um, is showing, you know, combined uh, the lowest uh, cost coverage at 130% of the Medicare allowable cost um, and, uh, you know, among the lower uh, for Medicaid. Uh, we see that, um, you know, the cost coverage on inpatient is actually below the Medicare allowable cost at Porter. Um, and for outpatient, uh, it is have 150 in my head, and so there it is. Um, so again, 
seeing that value being uh, the lowest uh, among the critical access hospitals. Um, and then finally for RAND, uh, this is back uh, 2018 to 2020, but we see very near the median back then for that time period uh, for inpatient care and a bit below the median uh, on the outpatient side. And so again, this is taking all those commercial payments, dividing by a standardized unit of service to try to get a sense of um, how much things cost on a unit basis. So um, yeah, so that was kind of the material that I thought was important to highlight uh, for Porter specifically. Uh, so Chair Foster, happy to turn it back to you for board questions. Great. Um, we can just go, I guess, in the same order if that's helpful. Um, I don't know if Ms. Member Lund, you have any questions, but go ahead if you do. Sure, thanks. Um, so I just want to confirm that Porter intends to participate in all the ACO programs with One Care for 2024. That is correct. Thank you. Um, could you speak to how you are integrating e consults into the hospital at Porter? Absolutely. Yes. So the, hi. Go ahead, um, so our e-consults are a network-wide initiative. Um, so it's really open to all hospitals across the network. But I was curious about what specifically was happening at Porter. Um, in terms of what, I'm sure, not sure I'm following. So how has Porter's uh, providers been using the e-consult feature? Did, are they using it more or less than other network hospitals? How is that rollout going? And uh, I'm just looking for a little more detail about Porter. I'll just note that I would say that your narrative was somewhat light for Porter in terms of detail on what's actually going on with this hospital. Yeah, thank you, Robin. Um, so the way we rolled out e-consults was in a staged fashion. So we did start with UVM Medical Center. Uh, so if we look at the total volume of e-consults, UVM Medical Center is higher for that reason. Um, and then in this fiscal year, we've rolled it out to the rest of the network hospitals. Um, and while the volumes are smaller at the other hospitals, they're mostly proportional to the size of the hospitals. Okay. Um... So on page 30 of the narrative where you've outlined the traveler's costs, I'm wondering if you could speak to why the, the dollar amount uh, for travelers is greater at Porter than at the other two network hospitals. I had thought I had read something in the narrative that you were centrally pure procuring. So could you speak to that, please? Yeah, we are. Um, we have centralized that process. Um, but it does take time for that centralized rate card to, to look the same across the whole network. So until, uh, so contracts are renewed on a typically a 13 week period. Um, and so if we have a consistent rate card um, as a network, it'll take time before those contract renewals actually um, are impacted by that rate card. So for a porter, it means that they're, they're still they haven't had enough contracts come up for renewal where uh, they start to get down closer to the um, to the uh, to the 105 that we have uh, for the for the other organizations, but they will uh, they will eventually get there. Thanks. Um, turning to the PHSO, um, I was noticing in your responses submitted this week. I'm just going to pull those up on my other screen. You included, and I appreciate it, two tables um, outlining the FTEs assigned to each by hospital. Um, so this is table page three and four tables one and two. Um, and I noticed that you included that for Porter, there are additionally um, about an FTE of support for the community health team that's not part of the PHSO. Could you speak to that? And and is that a Porter employee, someone else in the HSA? So are you, yeah, are you referring to the table two at the bottom? Yes. Yeah. So those are not not network non PHSO employees. So those okay. are those that when we want uh, when we speak specifically about the work that the PHSO has done um, to streamline 
blueprint funding. These are funds that are outside the system. So we just wanted to make sure we delineated that to make sure that it was clear. That thank you. That's helpful. So could you just explain that a little bit though? Because I thought as the fiscal intermediary that all of the CHT funds flow through the hospital. So they may flow through, but they would flow to an, an organization that then that uses that those funds to fund their own FTEs. Okay, I, I understand. Thank you. Uh, that's helpful clarification. Um, and then in the narrative, um, also in response to these questions, um, when I asked about the PMPM Blueprint and One Care payments and how those flow through to primary care, um, the answer was that those flow directly to the practice. Could you speak to how that works at Porter? How does that practice experience uh, that funds flow? Like, did they see it directly? Is it how is it included in their practice level budget? So I can speak to it at a high level, and then um, someone who is has more specificity may want to add. But so from a high level perspective. Um, all of those funds flow directly back to the practices, whether it's Porter or any other practice. So they're not they're not coming through the PHSO. They're not coming through a central intermediary. They they flow directly back to the practices. So how each individual practice then uses them um, are not under the purview of Population Health. Does that does that answer your question? And, and I can go a little bit further, Robin. Too in terms Sounds of great. the actual allocation of the the PMPM, it. Um, Internally, we we do it the same way as the money in terms of how the money comes into us. It's based on attribution. Um, so internally, we do the same thing. We allocate the dollars when they come into the health network. They go back out to the primary care practices and shows up as a revenue item for them based on um, based on their attribution. Great. Um, and I was hoping that someone from Porter could answer this next question, which is uh, for your um, FTEs that are assigned to your PHSO, um, can you speak to how um, those folks get connected with local resources and understand the local environment if they're not physically located um, in your area? They are physically located in our areas. They're attached to our practices uh, from the PHSO. Okay, thanks. Um, and then my, uh, I just have a couple more. So could I noticed in your narrative that you are, um, and I think actually you talked about this last year that you've started to replicate CVMC's workforce programs um, at Porter. Uh, I wonder if we could get an update on how that's going and where things stand. Yes, um, I can start. I'd be glad to start, this is Tom. Um, so slowly, slow but sure. I mean, we've been most invested in a partnership with Hannaford Career Center in, in Middlebury with an LNA training program that uh, provide we where we provide uh, funding for uh, folks that we interview and hire to work both in the hospital and at Helen Porter, our skilled nursing facility. They uh, work at a level while they go to school and train, and we support that training too. So that's been our most successful effort right now at, at at grooming our own LNAs. Uh, we've been recently working more and more. Well, we, they, we also worked with the Vermont uh, State College system to then fund those folks, move some folks transitioning to LPN programs. And that's uh, the next step we took with that. And that's uh, at a smaller scale, but growing. And we expect to expand significantly in the, in the coming year with the overall workforce initiative of the network. Uh, so by LPN, so we'll get to the full point where uh, CVMC started years ago with LPN, or excuse me, LNA to LPN to RN and then beyond. Great, thank you. Um, hold on just one moment. I just need to switch to another list here. Um, so um, switching gears a little bit now, I wonder if you could let us uh, give us a better understanding of what's going on with Helen Porter Nursing Home. What were the fiscal year 22 losses What in fiscal year 22 and what are the projected losses in fiscal year 23? I'll let uh, Scott uh, answer that. Um, I don't have the FY22 number handy, um, but I know that in the current year we're projecting a uh, five to six million dollar loss. 
Okay. And do you have a sense of um, of are, are there? I guess the way to ask this question is. Um, are there ways that you could potentially improve the profitability of Helen Porter? And have you looked at independent nursing homes that turn a profit to see if there are things you can learn from them? Um, well, so this is Tom. So um, I'm a little I'm a little confused because that's this. This is a little bit out of the. I appreciate that this comes under our global financial statement, but it's uh, non hospital entity. Um, I will tell you what we've done. We've worked extensively on all elements of the revenue stream at Helen Porter and the whole financial statement from the revenue side and the expense side to optimize operations. We're also engaged in that effort as a, as a network right now um, to lever our collective resources to optimize financial performance, uh, including the government payers. Um, a challenge for Helen Porter is that we have maintained full capacity the entire time uh, through the pandemic beyond uh, and largely with agency staffing. Um, so we have at any time uh, 30 to 40 or about approximately 30 agency staff in a skilled nursing facility where we're receiving 70% Medicaid payment. So, I mean, we are a lot of that loss has to do with the fact that we've maintained or we've chosen to maintain our same capacity um, with very high level labor costs. Um, so, you know, we are looking to to optimize every lever on financial status for Helen Porter. We also are working on a network wide initiative to quantify the value add uh, for our acute care settings of accepting pay of how we accept patients into the skilled nursing setting to lower the total cost of care, which is why we why our spectrum of care at, at Porter is so valuable. Uh, so we're working on that avenue to also. A couple other things maybe I would add um, is that we we did apply both Helen Porter and Woodridge uh, did apply for uh, increased Medicaid rates uh, to 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 help with the the significant cost inflation um, that they too have um, have experienced. Um, CBMC actually did get their rate request approved. We anticipate Helen Porter, you know, should be any day now, uh, which will help. Um, improve the finances, um, and as Tom Tom said, we're actually in the process of looking to um, uh, to manage our post acute facilities as a single service line, if you will, looking to optimize them from a leadership perspective, uh, operations, revenue capture. Um, we've submitted an RFP looking for a partner to partner with our leadership team. Uh, to look for those um, those um, those opportunities across all of our uh, post acute facilities. Thank you. And the reason why I'm asking about it is because the losses at the nursing home do have an impact on your bottom line, right? When we roll everything up as a network, yes, the the nursing homes that uh, that we do own uh, impact our overall network bottom line. Okay. And it used to be that it would impact Porter's bottom line. Is that no longer? how you're doing it financially? Uh, we still look at Porter Medical Center. We combine the two, but um, that's just historical. Uh, in reality, we're we're looking at the, the overall network uh, margin when we're looking at those those post acute uh, facilities because we have some in, in New York State um, as well. OK. Um, In looking at um, your profit and loss, uh, it looked like, and you've spoken a little bit uh, about the, Sarah mentioned the increase in outpatient revenue um, and decrease in projected pay inpatient. Is that shift related to uh, just general service line changes? Could you speak a little bit more to that as to what, what what is the, causing the shift of outpatient, inpatient to outpatient? Is that the ortho and the radiology that folks just mentioned? Yeah, that's the that's the majority of it. I don't know if there's any other services that are shifting to outpatient, Tom and Scott. Outpatient lab is also contributing heavily to that. Okay, thank you. Um, and then lastly, um, 
under your operating expenses, it looked like there was a 30% increase in other operating expense between fiscal year budget and and fiscal year 23 budget and fiscal year 24. Could you just explain what that's related to? Other expenses? Um, no. Just I'm in the narrative, sure. Robin? Yeah, I'm not Sorry. sure what you're looking at, Robin. Is this in the narrative? Uh, it's in the, I think it's in the PNL. We'll I don't have, have it in front of me, I'm, I'm afraid. But yeah, no, I'll, it's okay. We'll get back to you with what drove that, uh, that increase. Sure, of course. Um, and then I guess I did have one other question that I found. Um, so in in relationship to the increase um from the favorable medicare cost report how is that reflected in your commercial rate increase ask for porter if you look at our um narrative so we do have a grid like we've done for all the other uh, hospitals for the uh, for the rate increase i'm just flipping to it now um, so we do the calculation the same way that uh, we do for uh, UVM Medical Center and for um, uh, for 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 uh, CBMC. So you see it right there in terms of the the Medicare rate increase that we're anticipating. Uh, the six hundred and forty um, thousand um, is what we're anticipating there in terms of a of a rate increase. Uh, we also have the Medicare ACO uh, rate increase, which is really a you know a shared savings estimate at this point. But the same math that's done for our other two hospitals is done for Porter, and that's really what drives um, the the rate for for our critical access hospital to be lower than it is um, at our other two hospitals. Thanks. Um, and then I guess the only other question I have is when looking at Porter's operating expense increases compared to other critical access hospitals, it seems quite high. And so I'm wondering if you could just kind of talk me through that. Um, because quite frankly, when Porter joined the network, part of I think what folks were saying and I think hoping was that being part of the larger organization would achieve economies of scale and would help with expense growth uh, cost containment. So, um, but seeing those numbers compared to other critical accesses now, that doesn't seem to be the case, at least this year. So if you could just respond to that, I'd appreciate your thoughts. I think a component of that just this year, um, it could be uh, our shared service allocation uh, that changed for Porter, which would be different than other critical access hospitals that um, that are not part of a network. Um, certainly, when you look at the core expenses and the financial performance of Porter, um, cash balance, um, they've certainly um, the performance has increased uh, since they joined the the network, but in terms of that expense, um, that may be uh, that may be what's uh, what's behind that number. But we'll we'll definitely, uh, as I said, look into that expense number um, and get back to you. Looks like Tom wants to make a comment as well. Yeah, I will. I will add that we have also made a you know in in prior years, um, Porter had quite honestly artificially uh, limited some uh, expenditures that needed to be made. And I'd say that lied, lied largely with staffing investment. So as an organization, we have made a commitment to staffing investment, both in terms of people and in terms of pay. Um, in, in, the, uh, uh, in the union environment specifically, just to mark one, we have one union, it's the registered nursing union, and we provided for contracts that were in excess of 30% in the last three year period of time. And are similarly working uh, looking at the other speakers who have talked today um, in the public comment, we've, uh, we've also, uh, similar to our other partner organizations, been focusing on bringing um, all of our employees up to a market rate. Uh, in Porter's case, we had a longer way to go on that than our other partner organizations and have been making up for lost time in that area. So that has been uh, a key area of focus for us as an employer and an organization. Thank you. Those are my questions. 
Um, just a couple kind of similar along the last one that Member Lunge asked. Um, for the administrative cost, you had a correction for the shared services that were all going to UVM Medical Center. Is there a correction that can be done for the apportionment that should be going to Porter? Absolutely, yep. Have, have you done that? Uh, we didn't do it for the response that we sent back, but we can we can send that and follow up. Yeah, okay. If you could do that for Porter and CVMC, just so that you're not normalizing for one and the others are artificially low, um, that'd be good. Um, I don't know if you know this, but I was born at Porter. My brothers are born at Porter, and um, my family goes to Porter a lot, a nice hospital. Um, but one of the things that was sort of in the town back in the day when, when you're affiliating with UVM was people were really concerned that it would become more expensive. Is there a way to look at or compare whether or not Porter's expenses have grown faster as compared to peers since the affiliation? Um, if we have access to the critical access hospital data there, uh, we might be able to to do that type of uh, comparison, but not something we have uh, today. Yeah, it's reading, you know, some of these old digger articles. And um, one of them, let's see if we can get the date on this one. I'll just read you the quote from the old, the former CEO, quote, any new affiliations must bring greater value to people in the community and the network and will be scrutinized through that lens. Expansion will not hurt consumers. What consumers can expect is that we will always have the affordability of healthcare at the forefront of all of our strategies. We clearly get that affordability potentially can be a barrier to access to care. And that concept of um, you know, the affiliations not harming consumers. I was wondering how we as a state should look at that and evaluate whether or not this affiliation between UVM and um, Porter is driving up some of these costs or if it's saving them to member Lunge's question. Yeah, like I said, we we could we can take a look at that. Um, just not something that we're prepared to to, to do today. So to the I think, I think in the future, Owen, I think what we need to do better is be able to come back to you and say, here's the value that Porter is getting as a result of the affiliation. Here are the clinical exchanges that are going on. Here's how the patients are benefiting. It wasn't the way that we prepared for today that that I can recall, but but I hear that that's important. And you're bringing back these quotes in the past that I think I've cited that, and I think we believe that we're doing that, but let's bring that back to you. And if, if there's a way to do it quickly, I'll, I'll do it quickly, but um, but it isn't something that we've prepared, I think, for these budgets. Yeah, and Chair Foster, um, you, you know, the, I had this in my closing comments, but I think one of the biggest advantages is the access to resources that none of us could possibly have on our own. I mean, that's uh, in my career, a pretty long career in health systems. That's always been the advantage the small organization received. But I'd also say it's been the ability to really help us with a high value strategy as an organization. So at Porter, it's given us more access to uh, clinically appropriate services and access to clinically appropriate services scale to our organization. Um, the ability to bring those in in a financially sustainable way and uh, capitalize them. We haven't done a ton of it yet because capital has been very light um, because of where we're at. But I, I think it's been the ability for us to help uh, get a lot of strength behind a val high value strategy at a local community level. Yeah, that would be great. I, you know, it might not be something we prepared or discussed prior to this hearing, but you, you know, from the policy perspective of what we do, we hear people criticize and say, hey, these affiliations and this consolidation is driving price and it's driving costs. And I just would love to have a fair, honest conversation, pro and con um, on that, because I think it is something policymakers think about quite, quite a bit. And if there's increased costs that are coming from the affiliation, we should see if there's a way to remove them. And if there's increased savings that are really materializing to assist in this affordability challenge, 
we should definitely be highlighting them and, and recognizing them and informing and increased ourselves. Increased access and increased quality, right? Yeah, yeah. I, my brother asked, was complaining that they don't have all these services that they want at Porter. And I said, well, do you want to pay more for insurance? Because that's what it's going to take. And that leads me to my next question, which is you guys all know we're doing Act 167 work. It's underway in earnest. And one of the things that's happening is, are there infrastructure overhead or service lines that can be uh, safely uh, limited or removed? And I guess my question is, if there's a recommendation from the consultant on that, that, that says that that's a cost-saving opportunity for Porter, is Porter and UVM gonna be open-minded to that kind of recommendation? Absolutely. Yes. Great. I, I don't have anything else, but um, it's nice to see you, Mr. Thompson, and thanks for letting me ask you all questions on this. Thank you, sir. Good seeing you. Thank you. Hi, I just have a few questions. Um, Sarah, is there where you could put up Exhibit 9? Yep, it'll just take a minute. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I, yeah, I think my, my general comment, too, is similar to Member Lunge. Um, there's a little a little light on the on the submission compared to most of the other hospitals we're getting a lot of its network, but trying to find Porter specific stuff uh, in there is a little light, but but I think, you know, lar largely adequate. It's just hard to pull it out um, the way we organize our information. So I, I'm a little confused by a few of the components of this um, exhibit, which is in the net patient service revenue FVP lower box. Um, the all other, which you um, explained for FY24 in the letter that made up of employee self-insurance plan, small non-commercial, non-contracted commercial, public agency, workers' comp, self-pay, other. It's it's uh, on Exhibit 9, it's a really big number in 21. Then in 22, it's about half. Then 23 is the what you provided us, the breakdown. But then the commercial, so is that is that similar for for 21? Is that a similar makeup of those of those elements to the all other category there? Um, we're going to have to go back and take a look at that because we do make um, movements from time to time in terms of where um, insurance uh, lines roll up in, in these these roll up categories. Um, just looking at this list here nothing comes to mind in terms of what would have been a, a significant change there but we can definitely give you that same breakdown for 21 um, that we've given you here for the the 24 budget so part of why i asked that question oh go ahead i was just gonna um just i for, had forgotten to ask that i was uh, surprised to see the self-pay revenue uh equal at cvmc importer and, and just curious if that's uh, typical to have such a high proportion of self-pay at porter Yeah, that's um, so self pay is a combination of, of two things. So one is those that are covered by um, by insurance and they have their their co pays and those that are that are truly uh, uninsured. Uh, so the fact that those two are are near each other means that, the you know, the, the commercial the commercial amount of business at both organizations is is fairly has to be fairly similar because there's not a lot of self pay in the other in Medicare and, and Medicaid. Okay, thank you, thank you, uh, Board you, Member Merman. Yeah, thanks. If you go back to that exhibit, though, what the reason why I ask is initially when I was looking through the various hospital submissions, I, I noticed there was a hundred percent increase in commercial revenue from 21 to 24 at Porter. Um, which seemed striking to me. Um, and I was trying to understand that, but but if you actually combine the commercial and all other, while it's still a strong increase, it goes from forty six million to sixty three million. It's it's definitely you know it's more I don't know was that 40, 50, 50 to fifty fifty percent ish or something. So 
do you have any reflections looking at this? Is do you, do you, do you think the commercial business at Porter is just skyrocketed from 21 to 24? No, again, uh, th this has to be a, a mapping change between the, those okay. those time periods, and so we'll we'll get you the the change that happened uh, between 21 and, and 24. Yeah, there was a billing system conversion going on during that time, and I'm sure that that classification, as Rick mentions, is part of it. Okay, that would be that would be really helpful because I think that would probably change uh, some of the assumptions and. The exhibit 10 as well, which I think would be helpful to clarify. So, um, the other thing I just wanted to point out, I don't know if it's really relevant for this discussion, but I think it's kind of how how we're capturing data. I mentioned it to you, Sarah, on the tool. If you could pull up the tool for a second. Under the utilization tab. Uh, just being in the, the ED business uh, and kind of knowing what other departments roughly have for volume, these the ED volumes looked um, looked pretty high to me with a remarkably low admission rate. Uh, but but my understanding actually talking with Sarah, I think as you figured out that that might be including some of the urgent care patients or slipped into that. Is that what you said? That's correct. Uh, we discovered that there is a revenue code uh, that Porter is using in the hospital discharge data that not, we're not seeing from other hospitals that it looks to be affiliated with urgent care. Yes, yeah, so I just want to kind of flag that if you were to look through this and say, wow, those ED visit volumes look off for us. We're, we're not, we're, we're over counting them in our system, which would make you look like you would have a relative, I'm sure very few people are getting admitted from urgent care, if any, so your proportional admission rate would look higher. That's just one thing I was noticing on the data. That's all, that's all I have for now. Thanks. If I could follow up uh, on a couple of points that um, all three of my colleagues have, have had questions about. Um, and that's where is the savings or where is the improvement in quality communication, care coordination or outcomes following the consolidation? And um, Chair Foster asked if we could find that data. Um, there are publicly available sources um, and I, I hope we all get a chance to look at those. The Healthcare Cost Institute, the Healthcare Pricing Project from Yale, and the RAND studies on pricing transparency. All of those have looked at what's happened as hospital systems have consolidated. And if we don't like reading studies, we can Google the effects of healthcare consolidation on pricing and quality. What the evidence shows unexpectedly, we expected better care coordination, better quality, uh, better communication, and lower prices when this trend started 20 years ago, but we've not seen those things. It's been disappointing from a policy perspective. Across the country, and these data sets include Vermont, but across the country, Consolidation has not improved quality, access, affordability, communication, outcomes. It's raised prices. And the revenue that's come from the prices shows up in infrastructure projects, administrative layers, growth in those layers, and higher executive compensation. When I joined the board a year and a half ago, I wanted to find where those things, whether those things were happening in Vermont or not. They appear to be happening in Vermont. So if you have data from within that shows savings after consolidation, savings from the shared service organizations, improved access at organizations after consolidation, we would like to see them because they're not available in public 
data sources. That you're telling us that things are better, but we're not seeing that in the data that you provide us. And that is contrary to what the rest of the country is reporting. Member Walsh, do you have anything else? Okay, great. Um, I'll turn to the healthcare advocate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mike Fisher here. Um, just because nobody else is focused on it, let me just spend a moment looking at the numbers, uh, make sure I'm right here. Um, I think on Porter's profit and loss statement, you're showing projected 14 million excess revenue. For fiscal year 23, um, yeah. Mike. Yeah. And quite a quite a large NPR, 28.4 increase. So there's a lot of utilization increase. Is that am I reading that right? Uh, utilization increase, but also a fairly significant increase in Medicare revenue from updated cost report settlements. So catching up on the fact that 21, 22 uh, had saw significant uh, increases in contract labor and other expense growth that you're now seeing the adjustment uh, for that cost mm -hmm. report settlement in the in those numbers as well. And that and that boils down to I mean, your request is a 6.86 commercial rate increase. Is that also right? So that um, the 6.8 commercial rate increase um, is impacted by the Medicare rate increase that we think we will get in 24. The, the, the cost report settlement um, that you're seeing in the 23 data um, is specific to specific to 23. Okay, thank you. Public comment? Okay, and um, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Thompson, for any closing remarks you may have. Oh, I'm sorry, we do have a public comment. Um, Mary, how are you? Oops. Hi, I'm thinking I'm having some internet issues because you guys are moving a little slow, so I hope that you can hear what I'm saying. Um, I'm a nurse at Porter Medical Center. I work on the birthing center. I've been there 27 years. Um, so I've been here before affiliation and um, plan to be there for a few more years for sure. I'm also the treasurer of the Porter Federation of Nurses and Healthcare Professionals, which is our nurses union. Um, and just a note that we are in negotiations for our fourth contract um, as we speak. We have um, some sessions coming up in September. Um, we had some questions regarding um, a comment, a, narr um, a narrative on page 20. It listed uh, 3.9 labor expense inflation factor for PMC. Um, this is considerably lower than the labor expense inflation factors projected for UVMC and CVMC and lower than the 5.2 Bureau of Labor Statistics pro projects for 24. Um, and you're asking for the 28% increase and we just wanna find out what, what accounts for that um, wide discrepancy on that. Um, it, I can continue on with my questions or you can answer, but um, I'm not sure how you would like to address that. Um, I just have a few questions yeah I, I don't I don't have a problem if you have questions um, if that's okay with the Porter folks yeah. oh okay I'll just continue maybe I can get a written response on um, some of these questions um, and what with the budget that they've uh, uh, that 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 you've um, presented for PNC what is the total amount of percentage that will go to management and um, what may, will go to traveler salaries? Another question we had as a 
uh, union group. Um, and actually, a bunch of you have already spoken or asked this question regarding the uh, benefits of our affiliation and the cost savings and the cons of that affiliation. Uh, we too would like to know that information. Um, one thing that might be unique to our hospital is our administration has a dyad system for how they're running um, the upper management. And we wanted to know if there was, if you had any uh, information on the effectiveness of this dyad structure um, and the cost savings on that or expenditures on that. Um, and I think everybody else kind of talked about the other things, like I said, for the affiliation, the, the savings and the uh, pros and cons of that. Um, thank you very much. Great, Thank, thanks for your questions. Um, Mr. Vince, if, you, if you'd like, um, you can just send that into the board and we'll post it with your materials because um, I think they're relevant to the to the budget decision, some of the questions, so we, we can do that. Um, I don't see any others, so I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Thompson, for any closing remarks you may have on the Porter budget. All right, uh, Chair Foster, thank you for that. Thank you, Mary, for hanging in there and getting your questions out there. It's good hearing from you. So during this long day, I, I looked at my uh, uh, originally planned uh, remarks and wanted to go on and change them all, you know, right? So cause it's been a very informative day and there's been a lot of good, a lot of discussion. Um, I'll, I'll try though to stick with where I originally was gonna start because I think things, things still hold very true for us. So in preparing these remarks, I looked at the Green Mountain Care Board's mission, which is a focus around accessibility, affordability and quality. And saw that it being extremely aligned with Porter's strategic plan. You know, in our, in our organization, we have a nice component tree of the spectrum of care, uh, ambulatory care, acute care, skilled nursing care. We also have a strong focus on collaboration with agencies of similar mission in our community. So we know very much that we're not in this, we aren't the end all be all of everything in our community. And so actively seek out, we actually refer to it as intentional collaborations partners that help us fulfill our mission. Um, so that that permeates everything we do. Um, I've, this is the fourth Green Mountain Care Board hearing that I've been privileged to serve as president of Porter. And each year in, the, in my history and even preceding my history, we've always been pretty well complimented by this by the board for the responsibility of our budgets. And um, you know this year is no different. The thing I'd like to add though is I've been a CEO for 35 years. And this organization, the UVM Health Network, puts more rigor into the budget prep process than any organization I've ever been uh, privileged to serve in. So we are very focused on uh, being well benchmarked and providing the data that we believe will help you serve your role as regulators. Um, I will also add, though, it is really critical, you know, that that this budgets for our organization and our network be approved as presented to really help bring to life that that. Uh, uh, stabilize and sustain focus that we both agree is really important for the healthcare system in Vermont. Um, you know, at Border, like all of our partner organizations across the state, we've had a lot of profound challenges. The patient demand has been really challenging to manage effectively, and that's one of the best benefits of our health network is the ability for us to move patient care across our different settings as effectively as we can with the resources available to us. We also have talked a lot about the workforce shortage. I think the thing I want to point out here is the fact that Porter has always maintained capacity in all its care settings, despite the high cost of agency staffing, which we've been blessed by, but also it's been a huge expense for us. Um, you know, as I look at the 24 budget, we need a budget that we have submitted um, to, to help us uh, address these realities that we're facing so that we can help us recruit, hire, retain uh, key professionals and support staff throughout our organization to help us continue to invest in the pipeline program and expand upon growing our own staffing, which is a huge part of our future, and to address some of the new areas that we've not gone into before, but need to, things like housing in our community to help uh, support the uh, recruitment and retention of staff. The budget we've submitted also will um, combined with the philanthropy efforts that were uh, really focused on our community, help us maintain the level of resources in our balance sheet 
to bring needed investment to aging facilities. Right now, our Helen Porter uh, rehabilitation and nursing is one of those areas of focus. We're basically rehabbing a 30-year-old facility to serve some of our community's most vulnerable adults, as well as the mission it serves to help take some of that capacity out of our acute care settings and lower total cost of care. The next thing on that horizon, Chair Foster, you know our organization, you know that big priority on our hospital campus is our emergency department. And that is the next area of focus in our master facility plan to help uh, replace that facility. Um, we believe this, we believe we put forth a very responsible budget along with our organizations. We believe it's very important investment in our ability to provide exceptional care for, for our community. And we look forward to fulfilling any unanswered questions you might have about that budget. So thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson and to the to the Porter team. Um, we'll take a break. Um, so um, I'll turn it over to Director Lindbergh. Thank you very much. Uh, so turning our attention to Central Vermont Medical Center. Uh, notably, this uh, this facility showed the uh, lowest amount of growth uh, among the network hospitals for operating expense. Would you please comment on what's different about the expense profile for CVMC versus uh, particularly UVM MC? So a big piece of that is is obviously tied to the I think you'll, you'll see as well that the that the revenue uh, growth is is lower for CBMC. Um, so the the expense growth certainly flows with the amount of volume uh, that we've seen uh, change through that uh, that period of time. Uh, up until recently, um, as well, the in terms of the proportion of uh, the expense base that was in contract labor uh, for CVMC it was uh, certainly lower than the UVM Medical Center, um, and um, proportionally. Um, uh, lower than uh, than the Porter Medical Center, so those those two things are the the major thing the major items that uh, that, that drive that um, for for CBMC. Um, and again, I think we've got uh, we've got the CFO Kim Patnode on and and Anna if they want to add any um, additional comments. Oh, Rick, I think you covered it. Okay. Um, any insight about why some of the efforts to mi minimize contractual staff has been more successful at CBMC versus um, some of the other locations? So I'm um, happy to speak to that, um, uh, Rick, if that's okay with you. So um, I, I think we've mentioned uh, in the past and even earlier in today's conversation that CBMC has a number of workforce pipeline programs that we launched um, in 2018, and those have had um, a, a successful impacts on our need for um, traveler uh, to uh, cover our, um, our patient care needs, both at Woodridge, our nursing home, <clears throat> and in our acute care setting. However, I would say we are still um, utilizing travelers, as, as Rick alluded to, but I think that's a, a big piece of, um, of why um, the costs are, uh, are less uh, potentially, as those programs have been um, successful in uh, bringing staff on board in different roles from L LNA to um, LPN, LPN to RN, and now RN to BSN. And we also are obviously taking advantage of the network programs that exist um, in the surgical tech arena, respiratory therapy, and the and the like. Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, I also noticed that the kind of the distance between the operating expense and revenue growth is the the greatest uh, for CVMC as compared to other hospitals. Um, any insight about uh, why that pattern uh, might be true? Yeah, we we've definitely been um, been struggling, um, uh, certainly financially at CBMC for uh, for a little bit. Uh, revenues are, have not kept pace um, with uh, with expenses. Uh, part of that is again the the volume growth has not been as great at uh, CBMC as it has been in. Um, in the other two Vermont hospitals, so the the capacity that we have in certain services, so OB, uh, the operating room, other services, um, with that capacity at a certain at a certain um, place, um, 
the volume really hasn't always been there to to fill that uh, to fill that gap and um OR volumes have started to to pick up in the last few months uh, due to the the the, the peri op um, team that we have uh, centrally within the network, um, but there's still there's still some work to do to to ensure we've got um, strong volumes in all of our services at CBMC. you're on mute, Sarah. Thank you. It had to happen. Uh, so I was going to say, uh, this clearly shows that uh, the financial struggles appear more acute for CVMC as compared to Porter or UVMMC. Um, I was curious, it does look like a little bit more ambitious uh, margin recovery at CVMC from 23 to 24. So going from that negative three up to um, the positive two, I was just wondering, you know, what, you know, how you came up with that kind of benchmark for this budget. So a piece of that certainly is the work that we're doing um, in terms of volumes um, to, 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 to push where we know we have some access opportunities to get uh, more patients in. Um, Anna can probably speak to some of the efforts we have too to use some of the capacity at CVMC, um, particularly in the OR, um, where we don't necessarily have all the capacity that we need at the UVM Medical Center. So we're, we've started to, uh, we have been all along, but certainly a more concerted effort to try to move some some volume to CVMC. So that all factored into why um, we're anticipating um, a larger margin in FY24. In addition to what Rick mentioned, um, the other areas that we're focused on is in our um, ancillary support areas. So respiratory um, interventions, uh, radiologic interventions are examples of that. Um, so we're um, bringing more volume down um, to address the access issues that we're experiencing across the network where we have the potential, we'll bring those patients here to Central Vermont for those uh, procedures and tests. Um, and is the the volume you're kind of trying to help um, CVMC pick up? Is most of that coming um, from you know Vermont, or is any of the New York stuff coming down that way? You know, it would pretty much be all just Vermont uh, patients um, uh, that would be that would be uh, moving towards um, uh, CVMC in terms of doing those services there. Okay, thank you. Um, and then it it did look that um, of the three facilities, um, the kind of cost per FTE is the closest uh, to just the cost alone uh, index for CVMC. So um, just any reflections about why that um, that trajectory looks a little bit different? Uh, again, a piece of that is the the lower utilization as a as a total proportion of the staff costs of of contract labor um, that has driven that down. Um, another um, is, um, I believe, just the staffing mix um, in terms of the type of staff that we have at um, at CVMC. Um, Kim and Anna, I don't know if you have any other thoughts. No, again, Rick, I think you've covered it. All right, and uh, as you've already noted, uh, not seeing quite the same uh, change in utilization, particularly from 21 to 22, um, but did notice an even uh, more significant drop in recovery uh, during the pandemic there. Um, any Anything that you wanna note about CBMC during that um, difficult time? Yeah, again, the, the volumes definitely are not as uh, robust at CBMC. Um, the during the even before the pre-pandemic uh, period, which you see there before the, the 2019, um, uh, not not the same level of growth that we've seen in other in our other Vermont partners. Um, but we're working we're working towards using uh, the capacity that we do have there at CVMC uh, to meet the, the the access challenges that we that we have. Just to add to Rick's comment, I think that's part of the power of the network. 
um, is to work in that way as a collective to make sure we're meeting the needs of our patients um, across the network and across the state by opening up um, availability here at CVMC. We have the capacity, so having patients come down here um, is an advantage for them and obviously supports um, us as well. Thank you. Um, so as far as uh, migration, uh, not seeing a ton of uh, in migration sounds like uh, that might start to change as you're able to kind of redirect uh, some care. Um, and also um, seeing this uh, common drop from uh, calendar year 21 to 22. Uh, when I see that, I immediately am thinking about Medicare Advantage. And I just wondered if that patient population um, is uh, you're feeling that more acutely um, at Central Vermont than some of your other facilities? Not that I'm aware of that we've seen a, um, a higher penetration of, of MA plans there. Um, but um, if anybody else has, has any thoughts there, I know, Kelly, um, if, you're, if you've seen any data that says that CBMC would be unique in terms of the penetration, but I, I haven't seen, I haven't seen anything. I'm not aware, Rick. Okay, um, and then, uh, you know, this one's probably the um, weirdest uh, comparator group in Vermont since we only have two hospitals that fit in this categorization, but uh, we do see uh, Central Vermont being uh, below the median in this comparator group in terms of size. Um, and then uh, I think we already talked about kind of getting this adjusted, but we do see that, um, you know, despite uh, in the, that that is at that upper uh, 75th percentile for the admin to uh, clinical salary. So it'll be good to kind of get that adjustment for all the, the facilities. Um, CMI, anything to add about Central Vermont specifically? No, nothing more than what we've already shared um, earlier. Yeah, um, and then this one was notable to see, I was surprised to see that this um, among the peer group was at the 75th percentile when it looked like, uh, you know, your cash, uh, these cash on hand available were, were so low. Any uh, idea about what might be different about those data sources? Uh, so th this is mid-size or mid-size rural hospitals yeah. across the across the country? Yep. I mean, what that tells me is obviously there's a lot of um, there's a lot of mid-sized rural hospitals that are that are struggling. Um, if uh, if at that cash level, it you know the CBMC is is at the the higher end of the the benchmark. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then uh, profitability actually uh, more favorable uh, than peer groups during this time period might be related to the cash position we just discussed. Um, and then we see that uh, 12,000 per adjusted discharge, which uh, you uh, think might partially be measuring uh, deflated or, or uh, under-reported CMI. Um, as far as cost coverage, this is a place where, um, so we, we do see um, some uh, atypical uh, reimbursement rates for inpatient uh, among commercial payers and uh, a pretty, uh, significant decline in that cost coverage in recent years. Um, if we just look at inpatient uh, PPS hospitals, uh, we see that um, your payment is, or the CV, typical coverage of the Medicare allowable cost is the second lowest after Northwest. Um, and in the outpatient side, uh, we see that uh, CVMC actually has the lowest cost coverage at 185% of the allow Medicare allowable cost. So, I think um, just evidence that um, the reimbursements at CBMC haven't necessarily kept up with some um, of other hospitals. Uh, and finally, uh, RAND is showing uh, the, you know, right between the 25th and 50th uh, percentile for inpatient and just above the median on outpatient through, um, through 2020. Um, anything specific to, to note about either of those uh, indicators? Uh, no, nothing, nothing to add, sir. All right, um, that's what I had. Uh, over to you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Ms. Lunge, do you have any questions? Sure do. Um, 
so first again, just wanted to confirm that CVMC will be participating in all three ACO programs in 2024. They will. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry. So on the um, the blueprint for health information, I noted in your recent response that. Um, there that uh, in Barry, the QI facilitators have external responsibility outside of the network. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about that and um, how that came about and why Barry's different there. Sure. So um, we take our community um, <clears throat> partnerships very seriously, and that uh, bleeds over into this effort as well. So we're supporting um, our F, uh, FQHC playing field and another practice that's a private um, holistic practice um, in our community. So we are providing QI facilitation to those two air, uh, practices in our community. Great. Um, and has that historically been the case, Anna? Um, we've shifted from time to time, depending on um, how engaged they were in those programs, but um, that that's something that we're embracing um, and very happy to support them in those efforts. Great. Um, some of my questions have been answered, so that's good. Uh, so on exhibit 11 um, for CVMC, I was noting uh, if we look at the travelers line from 21 to 24, um, in 21, the travelers were quite low, which I seem to recall was related to the workforce pipeline programs, although I could be misremembering. Um, I wonder if you can just speak to that growth and whether you are expecting that your new normal is in the 70-ish range or whether you're expecting to get back to um, your lower levels. So I, I, I can start if you, if you want to, you know, then you can, sure. you can chime in. So one of the, one of the things, so what's unique about CBMC is actually the, so the nursing home is in these numbers. So on like um, the quarter budget that we just reviewed, um, the nursing home is a separate tax ID number. So the data for CBMC does include nursing homes. And we've made a conscious decision as a network um, to help with uh, inpatient throughput um, to staff the nursing homes um, as much as we can. Um, so the 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 increase here um, certainly is it's is purposeful. Um, we're trying to keep as many beds open in our nursing homes to help create the space we need for more acute patients in our in our hospitals. So that's part of the reason why you're seeing a bit of a a bit of an uptick here. Um, Anna, anything else to, to add? Yeah, no, you've really covered it, Rick. Um, the intention of opening up more uh, long-term care beds to help with the flow from the acute care settings here and at UVM um, specifically to the long-term care setting is why we've um, increased our staffing there and unfortunately had to increase it using uh, traveler costs, primarily in the LNA space, despite the fact that since we've launched our programs, we've had 82 graduates from our LNA program, still not enough. Um, uh, very challenging to recruit um, individuals into the long-term care spaces, I'm sure you're aware. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and just one moment, I'm looking for... Uh, my notes are not as good as I wished they would be. Um, but thank you for that. That's that's very helpful. I had noted in your narrative that you that you included that um, there are significant travelers through the nursing home, and that makes sense in terms of keeping those beds open. Um, so in the narrative, there is a discussion of um, actually. Never mind. We we discussed that. Um, in the narrative, there was some discussion of about the length of stay uh, being reduced, um, and I know you spoke a little bit to some of the um, 
some of the initiatives that you have of C at CVMC to increase the ER the OR volume, excuse me, but could you speak to that just a little uh, in a little bit more depth? There was a little tiny bit in the narrative, but um, again, CVMC like Porter's a little bit light and hard to pull the data out. I literally <laughs> did a word search <laughs> in the narrative. Um, so uh, if you could just talk to a little bit about that, um, that would be terrific. Sure. So just like EVMMC, we um, launched an initiative for progressive patient rounds at CVMC, and that's a multidisciplinary team coming together and looking at um, all of our patients that are in the acute care setting, identifying what barriers they may have to discharge. Um, and we actually do that on the first day of admission. So that's a, um, an evidence-based best, pra best practice. It's something that um, other organizations had done. We had it um, a little more informally, but we formalized it um, in the fiscal year and intend to continue that, um, that plan going forward. So that's really uh, been very helpful for us. And in part of that interdisciplinary team are also our social workers, case managers who are looking at what supports individuals need in the community to be successful in transferring into the community or returning home. So I would say that's probably been the biggest um, push for us that's um, seen nice results in reducing our length of stay observed to expected. And we do use a Vizient benchmark for that for us. So we're close to one, which is where we want to be. Um, that's the benchmark and i um, really grateful to the team that comes together every day to look at those patients and see what we can do to um, get them back where they need to be, which is in the home and in their community. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and then turning to your profit and loss statement, which is also report one, um, in looking at your projected um, NPR and FPP um, compared to budget, um, your budget for fiscal year 23 was just around 269 million and the projected is looking at 253 million, which my recollection is um, historically that has been um, a pattern for CVMC and is coming in under budget for revenue. Um, I'm just wondering if you can speak to um, the realism of reaching 290, almost 292 million um, this year. I mean, I'm sorry, in the 22, in the 24 budget, um, because of course, as as we've discussed in prior years, setting the expenses at a particular level with the revenue coming in, sort of creates, continues to create the challenges with the operating margin. So I'm wondering if you can just speak to that and, and why you think 292 is achievable. So, so some of it is definitely uh, what uh, we mentioned earlier in terms of using some of the capacity at CBMC to, to meet the access challenges that we have across the, uh, the network. Um, we feel like we're gonna we're gonna be able to do that to a larger degree this year than we have in the past, in part because we have um, as part of our margin improvement initiatives uh, that started last year um, created a centralized periop team. Um, so they are essentially managing the capacity uh, for all our ORs throughout the network. Um, they look to to maximize the um, both the physical capacity, and they they're they're reviewing the backlog of cases that need to be uh, that need to be uh, cared for. So that's one component. Um, I think there are other some other initiatives, some other volume related initiatives that um, that uh, Kim and Anna can can probably speak to. Yeah, the other area, um, in addition to the focus on periop services, as I mentioned, is um, opening up uh, more capacity on um, weekends for radiologic studies here. Um, again, reducing the wait time that may exist in other organizations, bringing them here um, and um, getting those um, evaluation studies done. So I would say that's that's the other um, big lever. Uh, we also have in the procedural area and the endoscopy suite another provider coming on board and um, who is um, 
a private provider that we're opening up capacity for so that we can meet that community need as well. But again, want to just reinforce the power of the network in the regard of the periop piece. Um, we've been we had been trying to do that work, but when we come together as a network uh, to really look at it centrally and say where the where does the capacity exist, who has the need, and can we match the need with the capacity? Um, I'm feeling uh, really good about the fact that um, the early results are we're able to do that and um, utilize the assets we have here in the periop space to fill fill that need for our patients that may be in Chittenden County or other counties. Thank you. Uh, I think that's it from me, Chair Foster. All right, thanks. Um, are there any hospitals that you try to emulate or that you admire? In, in in general, uh, Chair Foster, or yeah, I, I, when I was a lawyer in Burlington, I, I, there was a, a lawyer out in the Western District of Virginia, and I, I thought he was just amazing. His name's Randy Ramsire, and I tried to start working with him and learning from him, and try to be like him. Is there any hospitals that you try to be like? So what? Um, I'm pretty data driven. So um, the hospitals that we try to emulate are the ones that are the strongest performers in the Vizient data set, and that's a data set that looks at quality measures um, and takes all top performers. And uh, we have a way to access uh, what they're doing from the standpoint of best practice. So we have a comparator group in that data set. Um, that are community hospitals of like size. So we look at those hospitals and say, how are they achieving outcomes in, in uh, one area or another? And we have open discussion with them about how they're doing that and um, looking to accelerate our improvement here locally. So I would say our, our um, we try to emulate those top performers in the community space. Um, it's a little bit more challenging to find community rural hospitals that are associated um, in that database, but um, we found some and those conversations are, are going, which is, which is great. So again, we're trying to emulate top performers in the quality arena. If we focus on quality, we'll get the cost out as well. And who are those hospitals? Um, there's there's a number of them um, on the uh, West Coast as well as um, in the uh, Midwest. What, what sorry? What are their names? I want to look at their data. Um, it, it's unfortunately it's not open to the public because it's a very discrete data sharing that we do. Um, so most of the hospitals in the community data set are part of academic systems around the country. So they're a show associated with them, but they're, it's not an open data set, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah, I'm just trying to get what hospitals do you emulate, but not where they are in the data set or what their data is, but what are the names of the ones that you're trying to shoot for, to strive for? Yeah. They're the hospitals that are associated with the top academic centers in the country. So those include Mayo, um, Cedar sinai NYU Langone as an example. So the community hospitals within those data sets. And then you're in communication with them, trying to learn from them? Correct. They have a number of collaboratives that are available um, in different quality domains. And so we work with those individuals um, on those um, collaboratives. Um, and then in the 2018 Workforce Pipeline Initiative, why did you start doing it in 2018? What triggered you to think that that was something that should be um, pursued? I'm sorry, that was with the Workforce Pipeline? Yeah. Yes. Um, so we, we've known for years that there's been, a, in particular, a nursing shortage at a national level. That's not news to us. Um, it certainly was um, accelerated with the pandemic, without doubt, and, and the resignation, the great resignation that we've heard about. So we were well aware of the impacts of, of that shortage at a national level. So with that in mind, we um, started having conversations here locally. We actually um, engaged with then Congressman Welch um, to have a conversation across the state with the um, uh, talent pipeline uh, program that's a statewide program and brought other constituents in to say, how are we going to address this here? Um, so we had planned to launch our program. We did launch the program, kept it going during the pandemic. Um, and unfortunately, the workforce issues have only accelerated um, in part because of the pandemic, but also because of the, an aging workforce. 
and healthcare. I think the average age for a nurse right now is 55. Um, that's um, pretty striking, considering that we have an aging demographic and more patients that are going to need our services with fewer care providers to deliver that service. So that was really the, the emphasis. I'm a nurse by background, so I have a particular interest in that area, but it's um, something I've been watching for some time. Mm -hmm. I got a Vermont nurse around the corner from me right now who's 43, so she's uh, helping the demographic. Um, uh, in terms, so like when we speak of the, you know, the benchmarks and within range, that can mean, I guess, I think it means 25th to 75th or some things. It's like, okay, you're median. Are, are you satisfied with being, you know, within range or around the median? Or if you hear something is at median, is that something you think you can can work on improving? And if so, what are the things that you think you can achieve? Yeah. So um, obviously, we always strive to improve our performance. Um, I always like to look at top decile performance. Um, if possible, that's usually a stretch, to be honest. But I think the stretch is what we, um, the people that we serve deserve. So not uncommonly, we're looking at those high performers um, within the data set that I mentioned earlier and identifying how they're achieving that level of performance. So you know, my, my goal here um, within this organization is to achieve that level of performance as compared to other community hospitals. We're not there yet, to be honest. Uh, we're working on it, but we've certainly, with some attention, improved our length of stay. We're going to continue to look at that. Uh, we've improved our um, um, mortality observed to expected, so we're now uh, below the benchmark there, which is wonderful. That's good news. Um, and there's other areas that we have to continue to focus on. But yes, we're always looking to strive to be a best performer to the degree we we can possibly do that. And, you know, sometimes these hearings focus on what you're not doing well, but I think that's just because everyone's trying to improve things. So we're sort of take for granted all the good stuff because um, we're trying to find ways to improve things. Um, with that, just be aware of that, that. That's sort of an unfortunate part of this, although there is some celebration of good performance, of course, as well. But what are the things as you look at your hospital's performance that you think are the what are, the, what are the worst parts of the performance that you're seeing, the things that you think need to be improved the most? Well, obviously our margin, you know, it's no it's no loss on um, this group that that's been a struggle for CVMC. Um, we have an interesting payer mix here. Uh, we have a very aging demographic. Um, most of our acute care patients are medical patients. They're not surgical patients. And so bringing some of that surgical volume at CVMC will make a huge difference for us. It doesn't take much of that surgical volume to, to see some improvement. And again, that's care that people need. Um, it's care that they um, are, are required to have and just bringing it down here will help us significantly. So I would say that's an area, obviously a focus for us. Any, any others? as it relates to finance or, or the quality domain? Just performance, possible. when you're looking at those, you know, the Mayos, the Cedars that you're trying to reach for, yeah. Yeah. and you're yeah. looking at your data, where's the area where you think you can improve the most? I think there's still some opportunity uh, in some of the quality measures. Um, as I mentioned, we're, there's two quality measures that we are doing well in, like the stay now and mortality, but there's a few other um, areas where we have some opportunity for improvement that are very clinically driven. And we've, again, got partnerships across the network to focus on those, as well as working with um, our colleagues around the country. Um, and then what about the admin costs? I, I know that there can be some disagreement on the admin costs, but I think it said it were on 75th percentile and potentially if that data is normalized for the shared services, that might even move up. Is that a number that you think you can shoot to improve or is there is it good where it is in your opinion? Well, I think if um, we're still looking at that data a little bit more, I don't know, Rick, if you want to talk about what's driving a little bit of that push for us of being on the higher end. Yeah, so again, the, the data and the tool is a combination of the general um, and administrative salaries. So um, we definitely want to do some more digging on that general piece. So the impact that um, all the non-clinical staff uh, have on that, that ratio, we just haven't had the time to really do some, some digging there. But to answer your question about the shared service, shared administrative services, because I did make a, a comment and we shared the data that when you look at those benchmarks, we're at the median. Um, 
and and we're clear that that's not that's not good enough. Um, we we definitely think that there's opportunities to uh, to improve there. Um, a big piece of that will be standardizing on all of our systems across the network so that you can um, capture some of those economies of scale. So right now we're not all in the same payroll system. We're not all in the same HR system. We're getting there. We're close. Um, the other area that's really starting to um, show some promise in terms of administrative shared services is technology. So artificial intelligence, robotic process automation, um, those technologies are certainly going to have an impact on our cost structure going forward. Um, it will reduce some of the some of the the personnel needs that we have um, in in certain areas. Um, so we absolutely um, can do better um, in those in those areas than just being satisfied at being at the at the median. Okay. Um, well, thank you both, and Ms. Noonan, nice to have your responses. I appreciate that, and um, I'll turn it to Member Walsh. No questions. Great. Um, healthcare advocate, do you have any questions for CVMC? The healthcare advocate has no questions for C CVMC today. Great. And is there any public comment? Okay. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, there, Miss Miss Stickney. Did you have a? Hey, Holly Stickney. I don't know. Um, uh, I'm um, raising my hand as chair of the UVM Network Board, and I'm, excuse me, wanted to get a few comments on the record before we go into executive session relative to executive compensation. And I don't know, Anna, were you going to make some closing comments before uh, we ended? I, I was, but I can do it after you ask your uh, make your comments, Sally. That's fine. Okay, well, um, as the uh, governance oversight board of the um, UVM Health Network, uh, I wanted to make sure that for public comment, it was clear that we have a board of directors that is carefully monitoring our executive compensation at the, at the executive level. Um, and we are a board made up of volunteers from throughout the network. Um, we have an obligation to our communities to provide the best possible care in the most accessible way to all who need it. And we also, as a board, have an obligation to make sure we're attracting the best talent we can to uh, lead this network that we care so much about. So we'll talk more about data specifics in the executive session, but for the record, I want to make it clear that we indeed are very data driven and we work from very clear philosophy. And it's interesting that we all just uh, were talking a minute ago about uh, about the median. And the reality is that, that for executive compensation, we are very clear that for salaries, we are we set it at the median, the 50, 50th percentile. And that's the that's the um, that's the goal we're going for, and that's the data that we monitor and that we monitor on a regular basis. <clears throat> so the board is uh, takes its responsibilities very seriously, accuse the lawnmowers outside, um, takes the, and we, we compare ourselves regularly. We have a very rich database that uh, is brought forward to the board. And so we have a deep, we have a deep set of data by which the board can make its decisions um, and feel like it's doing a fair and adequate job. So uh, it's important to us as a full board to make sure that that's publicly publicly stated. So thank you for the time. Uh, thank you for commenting. Um, and Ms. Noonan, uh, please go ahead if you have a closing remarks for the board. Thank you so much. Sure. So again, I just want to reinforce that CVMC, we're keenly aware that our budget impacts the lives of the communities we care so deeply for. Uh, this summer's devastating flooding underscored the indispensable role played by CVMC and other healthcare institutions in our communities, particularly in a time of crisis. I'm proud of our staff for their response to the recent flooding emergency, and I'm proud of the work we do every single day to provide high quality, high touch care to those we have the privilege to serve. However, the flood is not just one, it's just one of numerous challenges we faced in the past years. Like all healthcare providers, we've navigated the COVID-19 pandemic, taking every necessary step to respond to the crisis that was a global issue and to protect our community's health and well-being. 
Meanwhile, we continue to grapple with the effects of inflation, staffing challenges, as well as reimbursement rate cuts from Medicare and private insurers. Last year, every hospital in the state, including ours, operated at a loss. This despite numerous efforts to find efficiencies in our operations. This is not a path to a strong and resilient healthcare system for our state. As a non-for-profit, CVMC exists to provide healthcare to our community. We have strong partnerships with Central Vermont with other health care providers and human service providers. As I mentioned, CVMC serves as a convener for our accountable community for health. We are also the convener for something called the Central Vermont Prevention Coalition, which is focused on supporting our community members with challenges with substance use. We need a positive margin to keep pace with the changing needs of our patients, support improvements to our aging facilities that are desperately in need, and to invest in technology that our patients expect. The budget we put together for the next fiscal year is a reflection of CVMC's commitment to provide the best possible care to those we serve, maintain readiness to respond to future crises, and continue serving our community for generations to come. We must be able to cover our expenses. Those expenses are a reflection of the care we continue to provide in the midst of these ongoing challenges. And we've mentioned before the cost of increased pharmaceuticals, supplies, and then the nationwide staffing shortage. This despite, we're still having that staffing shortage despite all the numerous and I think innovative workforce pipeline programs CVMC has invested in since 2018. I really appreciate your consideration of these challenges and their impact on CVMC and on our network, our patients and our community. And I wanna reinforce that the budget we submitted for FY24 is what we need to continue to serve our central Vermont community. Thank you again for your time. I know it's been a long day for everyone, but I appreciate your attention. Mm, thank you very much. Um, I have a couple quick questions um, relating to the request for a executive session. Um, so one, I, I want to ask about the contracting with um, insurance companies and get into some of the details of those contracts. Uh, is it your position at the Health Network, Porter and CVMC, that discussing that in the public uh, would be uh, dis disadvantageous? It is, Chair Foster. Inappropriate. Sorry? Yeah, we shouldn't do that publicly. And it would place, you think, um, the hospitals at a substantial disadvantage with respect to contract negotiations with insurers? Yes. I'm sorry, Mr. Merrill, I, I don't believe you're sworn. Is that right, or are you? Uh, I am not sworn, but I don't think this is testimony per se, uh, Chair Foster. This is, as I understand, is a discussion to determine whether or not the upcoming discussion meets the legal standard for uh, being taken in private session. Is that right? Uh, it's a factual assertion. So if there's a witness who can swear to that, that would be helpful, I think. I'll ask Rick perhaps then to answer those questions instead. Thank you. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, we also understand that there's some um, potential contingency plans. Uh, should there be cuts? And would you find, uh, is it your position and testimony that public uh, discussion of those plans would place uh, the UVM hospitals at a substantial disadvantage? Yeah, I don't I don't know if it's that it places us at a disadvantage, Chair Foster, but I think it's inappropriate for us to publicly share the possible contingency plans because I think there could be a lot of anxiety and trepidation based on that. And the way that we would actually get to those contingency plans would involve a, a conversation with the entire network, with our board, our community, before we'd actually have to be able to deliver on those. So I think to share it in executive session to say, here are the things that we're looking at um, if, our, if our budgets aren't, aren't able to be realized is I think is a more appropriate place to do that. Okay. Um, well, so the standard is that it has to, um, uh, um, yeah, go ahead, Russ. I don't mean to jump in. I had two things, um, <clears throat> and sorry, my voice. Um, first was I, I think we've had some back and forth and analysis regarding the confidentiality of the of these potential contingency plans, and I'm happy to um, 
be a circle back off offline here. If we need to um, kind of discuss that further. The other one is a little bit more of a practical issue, which is um, <clears throat> there are, I believe, only three board members on the call right now. Um, an executive session requires an affirmative vote of two thirds of the board. Uh, so we would need to get Dave um, back into the meeting, <clears throat> which may take us a few minutes. So perhaps it makes the most sense to simply rejoin this meeting at 615. Uh, take the motion then. And and then switch over to the executive session link if that's acceptable. I, I think that sounds like a reasonable approach. So why don't we do that? We'll adjourn till 615 and we'll get member Merman back. Um, and before we adjourned, we were discussing uh, whether or not we'd go to executive session. Um, understanding that UVM Health Network views the cost reduction plans as confidential and, and sensitive for several reasons. Um, so I'm going to ask a question around that. Um, UVM Health Network, uh, could some witness confirm your position that a reason for confidentiality is that the materials in the cost reduction contingency plans uh, is that the information gives UVM Health Network hospitals a competitive advantage? Yes. The information or use it. Great. OK, so I will move that the board go into a confidential session under 18 VSA 9457 uh, a which allows the board to examine and discuss confidential information outside of public hearing or meeting, notwithstanding the open meeting law. Uh, in order to examine the hospital's cost reduction contingency plans and discuss negotiations between the hospitals and commercial insurers. Uh, the cost reduction contingency plans have been described as containing competitively sensitive financial information that our legal counsel advised could be treated confidentially. Is there a second? I will second, but I note that Russ has his hand up. Uh, Can I just McCracken? I'm sorry, a technical, maybe a technical amendment you might consider. It's 9457B, as in boy. 9457B. Let the record reflect the correction from Mr. McCracken. And all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Um, the motion carries unanimously. I'll call back to order uh, our meeting. Um, is there any old business or new business to come before the board? All right, hearing none, I just wanted to thank our staff and Cassidy uh, and UVM, of course, and the healthcare advocate. Very long day, and I apologize for running so long, but it's a very important discussion. So thanks a lot to the staff and Cassidy and UVM for doing it, and Mr. Fisher, of course, and the other board members. Um, with that, I will move to adjourn this hearing. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Aye. We're adjourned. Have a nice night.